We're at Fort Mims Park. It's a, a little five acre park in the southern end of Alabama and it's the location of a major battle between the Americans and Creek Indians in 1813. Uh, the uh, fort itself was full of uh, all kinds of folks taking shelter from an impending Indian attack. It included Indians that were allied with the Americans, uh, local settlers, militia from Natchez area of Mississippi uh, territory, and lots of slaves, about 500 people inside this fort. And in August, on August 30th of 1813, uh, a faction of the Creeks that was uh, quite upset with American policy toward Indians attacked the fort, and there was a long battle. And at the end, some 250 to 300 people inside the fort were, uh, were killed. And it's largely known as the Fort Mims Massacre in uh, most uh, older history books. That's how I first learned about it. It was in fifth grade when I read about the, the, the Fort Mims Massacre. But there was much more to the story. The, the Creeks, uh, like most American Indians, uh, had to find a way to deal with the expanding American settlements uh, throughout the late 18th, early 19th centuries. And in this area, uh, the, uh, the Creeks actually were quite successful, as were the Cherokees, in uh, at least some portion of them assimilating to American lifestyle. So uh, quite a few wealthy Creeks in this area owned slaves. Uh, they had big plantations. They raised domestic livestock and uh, largely were kind of accommodating their way of life to American norms of agriculture and other kinds of things. Um, but a large part of the Creek Nation didn't see the advantage to that. They wanted to maintain their traditional life ways. And so there was a real rift in the Creeks in 1813. A civil war broke out. And uh, what happened here at Fort Mims kind of was a continuation of that civil war, but it did bring the Americans then into the war against the Red Stick Creek faction that was anti-American. There, there was a religious component to it. Uh, the uh, Shawnee uh, prophet and his brother T uh, Tecumseh uh, were proselytizing for a new uh, kind of re religious way of life uh, for American Indians at that period. And Tecumseh came here and converted a lot of Creeks to that religious, uh, fact, yeah, that prophet uh, religion. And uh, so there was that, there was, a, there was a political angle as well. The, um, most of the Creek leaders at the time were in the pay of the American government in one way or another. And uh, so their families, their lineages were profiting while other lineages who were out of power were suffering uh, considerable from poverty uh, by the early 1800s. So there are, there's a lot of reasons why individuals chose one side or the other. Uh, but um, in this area, most of the local Creeks were pro-American and decided to stay on that side of the, of the Civil War. And a couple of those very, very prominent people, William Weatherford was from this area, and he was actually the leader of the Red Stick attack on Fort Mims. On August uh, 30th, 1813, the uh, folks inside Fort Mims had been forted up for about a month. Uh, there had been a skirmish back in July, uh, not too far away, that involved some of the militia from the Tensaw area right here around Fort Mims. And uh, apparently the Red Stick attack was in response to that skirmish, they, the, the, uh, actually the Creeks had been in their own nation, within their own territory, and they were attacked by Americans, so they felt they were, uh, we were wronged by that, uh, and they decided to take revenge, uh, particularly on the Creeks in this area of the Tensaw that sided with the Americans. So uh, in the morning, uh, the um, folks inside the fort uh, had to go out and find food. There were 500 or so people within about an acre-sized fort. Uh, so uh, very cramped conditions, and they had to go out and forage every day for food. So people dispersed and went and tended their cattle, uh, began to harvest crops from nearby fields. And uh, so that went on throughout the morning. There were various sightings of, of Red Stick Creek warriors in the area, mostly by uh, African slaves. Uh, uh, and they reported this to their owners, but weren't believed for some reason. And in fact, one of the slaves was being whipped at the time of the attack for having spread false rumors. So uh, the, uh, the attack was really quite a surprise. Probably shouldn't have been, but the, uh, the garrison was not a formal military unit. They were all militia from local and, and territorial uh, militia units. And so very badly led. The fort itself was very badly built. Uh, the uh, gun loopholes, which should have been about five or six feet above the ground, so that defenders could fire down on attackers were at three foot level, so they were essentially on level with the uh, attacking force who ran up and took possession of those loopholes and began to fire into the fort. Uh, the battle went on for quite a long time. There were maybe 750 or so red sticks in the attacking force and uh, about several hundred uh, actively fighting inside amongst the many civilians and other, other people inside the fort. 
And uh, by sometime around the afternoon, two or three o'clock in the afternoon, the, fort, the uh, battle kind of stalemated. So the Red Sticks withdrew, decided whether they should renew the attack, and eventually they did. And they, at that point, they set fire to a good portion of the southern part of the fort. That fire spread throughout the entire fort. And uh, at that point, defense was impossible. So the few remaining defenders tried to escape, and uh, quite a few were killed or captured, but about 25 made it out of the fort. The, uh, the battle immediately made all the papers throughout the country. It was uh, considered a huge disaster of, military, uh, of American military might. And it uh, took quite a while for the uh, local armies to reconstitute themselves. The Mississippi Territorial uh, Volunteers were really devastated by this. Uh, but eventually they uh, organized a southern army to invade the Cree Nation from the Mobile area. Uh, the Georgians um, organized a couple different attacks from the east, and then the Tennessee uh, troops under uh, several generals, but most famously Andrew Jackson, invaded from the north. And uh, this actually was one of the major outcomes of the battle, was this uh, introduction of Andrew Jackson into the War of 1812. Uh, his successes uh, throughout the Creek War, especially at Horseshoe Bend, uh, made him famous throughout the country, but also convinced the leadership in Washington that uh, he could actually fight and win. And so he was given command of the army at New Orleans and eventually defeated the British there in early 1815. Andrew Jackson is, of course, a controversial figure for many reasons. He did all sorts of uh, radical uh, new sorts of policies in, in all aspects of government. But uh, certainly one outcome of, of, the, uh, of his experiences during the Creek War was uh, his determination to see Indian removal uh, finally occur throughout the eastern United States. Uh, a lot of people like um, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson had, f had tried to formulate a policy of assimilation where Indians could essentially become Americans uh, in, their thing in their sense of the word and stay where they were located but on smaller parcels of land. Uh, the American Indians, of course, had populations in the tens of thousands, yet they owned millions of acres of land. and uh, the American government was under tremendous pressure by American settlers to take that land one way or another. And so uh, Jackson actually was quite excited when, the, when he heard the news of Fort Mims and saw this as a, as a perfect opportunity to take land from the Creeks. And uh, he eventually negotiated the Treaty of Fort Jackson at the end of the war that took 21 million acres from the Creek Nation, uh, both from the Creeks that he fought with as well as those he fought against. And, uh, Twenty years later then, of course, when he became president, uh, he was able to then uh, push through the Removal Act of 1830 that did lead to wide-scale forced removal of Indians from the, from the east, southeast, as well as the, north, the old Northwest Territories up in the Ohio country. The attack itself, uh, of course, launched the, uh, the invasion of the Creek Nation and the confiscation of all this land, 21 million acres, uh, which immediately after the war was opened up for settlement. So uh, Alabama and a good bit of southern Georgia would not, have been, um, would not have been settled as early if it hadn't been for this war. And there was actually a thing called Alabama fever, this big land rush uh, in, in the years uh, following the war. So that was the most immediate uh, impact. And then, of course, the Removal Act, uh, this, this uh, sense of betrayal the Americans felt at, the, at this sneak attack, the way, they, the way they viewed it, you know, there was a sneak attack and then a massacre. They felt very much betrayed because in previous years, people like Benjamin Hawkins, the federal agent, had tried to, their best to assimilate Creeks. And this was a very clear uh, response from the bulk of the Creek Nation that they did not want to become Americans. So uh, that gave a lot of force to the removal proponents to actually move Indians out of this area permanently. The conquering spirit, a conquering spirit is a phrase that Benjamin Hawkins used. He was a federal agent to the, South, to the Southern Indians. And uh, when he first uh, got wind of the Red Stick movement, this prophets movement, uh, which was largely religious at first, but also very militaristic, uh, he said that the Red Sticks were possessed of a conquering spirit uh, by the, uh, the master of breath, uh, the Shawnee uh, uh, great spirit uh, figure. And so, uh, so he, I thought that was appropriate for that perspective, but also, of course, when the Americans are attacked at Fort Mims, their response is to re respond in kind and, and uh, basically go in an, into an all-out war with the Creeks. And so I thought a conquering spirit kind of captured the essence of what was going on on all sides of this conflict. We were initially, uh, I was part of a team of archaeologists who was um, contracted by the Alabama Historical Commission to look at the archaeology that had gone on here for the last 50 years. It's been a lot of digging at the site of Fort Mims 
and uh, we uh, had uh, thousands of artifacts and no report uh, to, uh, to speak of. So, so anyway, we spent about a year back in 2003, 2004, analyzing the archaeological collections. And it was in the process of doing that that I began to read up on the history and see that there were uh, there's a lot of very old uh, historical ideas that needed to be re-examined, a lot more evidence available now than had been back in the 1890s when the last major work had been done on the, on the Ritzig War. So, uh, so the archaeology really led me to the history. I hope that people uh, who read uh, A Conquering Spirit see that, uh, that American frontier uh, life had lots of, um, of different perspectives. Uh, certainly the Creek perspective has been kind of underrepresented in history and, and uh, Indian perspectives in general although that's clearly changing now. So I hope that people try to understand the red stick point of view. They weren't evil incarnate as they were portrayed back in, the, uh, in that era of the war by the American press. Uh, they had all kinds of legitimate grievances and the outcome of course is tragic from all perspectives, but it was, uh, it's, a, it's a very instructive period to study. I kind of viewed Fort Mims as a, um, I, I kind of viewed it as, as similar to many other stories that often, are, often fiction writers will, pick some kind of vessel like the Titanic or, or a rowboat or lifeboat or a space station, some kind of contained uh, entity in which people interact and really kind of show their true selves, you know. And, and I thought that that really is what was happening at Fort Mims. We see uh, the cruelty of the, of the commander here, uh, Daniel Beasley, who had been a sheriff in the Natchez area, uh, whipping the slaves that actually were telling him the truth about the approach of the of the Red Stick uh, Creeks, the, uh, all, the, all the different kinds of kind of human stories that go on within that fort, I think were, were, were most fascinating to me. And really trying to delve into the genealogy of these individuals showed in fact that they were all quite closely related. Uh, they, these people were fighting on opposite sides, but they all knew each other. They'd yell insults back and forth. And it was a very, very personal war uh, played out here on a kind of a small scale, really. But um, it's like the, the American Civil War crunched down into a little <laughs> tiny event in, in many ways. You see all the same kind of stories here at Fort Mims as you would see in a bigger picture like the American Civil War.